For years, Minky Couture has been donating blankets to NICUs across the country. Owner Sandy Henry's grandson was born at 30 weeks, and she placed a mini blanket in her grandson's incubator. We want to help other NICU families with the Heart of Minky program. For every adult-sized blanket purchased, Minky Couture will donate a mini-sized blanket to NICUs across the nation. Thanks to you, we can fulfill our dream to blanket the world. Today's episode of Space Nuts is brought to you by Physical Attraction, a new podcast that tries to explain physics one chat-up line at a time. Available now from wherever you get your podcasts. 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello once again, and thank you for joining us on the astronomy podcast that we call Space Nuts. comes in assorted packets and uh, doesn't actually give you any problems with allergies. Uh, but uh, joining me as always is Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical <laughs> Observatory. Hello, Fred. <laughs> Hi, Andrew. I would imagine that there are several people who are allergic to us. Uh, <laughs> You know, some people are allergic to cats, but some oh, people... I'm definitely one. It's funny, yeah, I grew up movie. with cats, never had a problem as a kid, but as an adult, I'm a mess when I'm around cats. I don't know what changed. It's very uh, strange. Yeah, I think you grow up. Oh, that's the thing. Uh, allergies are like that. They they don't come and go. They just come. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's bizarre. <laughs> and, and I'm probably li living in the worst region in Australia for it. And um, not, you know... It rains cats and dogs sometimes, but there's so much pollen around here in spring. It's, um, it's horrible. It's horrible, Fred. Now, uh, <laughs> we are going to talk about the, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and uh, the fact that it's uh, been focusing its, focusing its beady eye on Phobos, one of the moons of Mars. We're also going to look at the first known moon beyond our solar system, or exomoon, and um, noctilucent clouds. We'll find out what they are. Um, you have to take a special drug to see them, apparently. <laughs> but, uh, f but first of all, uh, Hubble, uh, looking at Phobos. Why so? Why not? Why not? Well, that's, a, uh, that's another answer. Yes. <laughs> and segment so, two is about. <laughs> the, um, look, uh, the Hubble uh, is still an absolute triumph of, uh, of you know, space engineering that that is providing us with the most amazing data from the solar system and beyond. It has, it's still a very, very useful piece of kit, even though next year it will probably be replaced by the James Webb Space Telescope. So it's, at the moment, it is the telescope able to produce the finest detail in images of, for example, the solar system. And so why not use it to study some of the nearby planets? So uh, what we have had revealed recently uh, is some beautiful images of Mars, um, which show uh, Mars's biggest satellite. Actually, I should say it's bigger satellite because Mars only has two satellites. Uh, they are called Phobos and Deimos. Uh, I think they, the names mean uh, fear and horror. Uh, <laughs> they, they, they were specially chosen to to be suitable names for satellites of the god of war when they were discovered in the 1880s, I think, or 1870s. Uh, anyway, uh, Hubble has uh, managed to reveal uh, Mars's larger moon, Phobos. And this is a triumph, really, from the distance to Mars between here and the Earth. I mean, sorry, Mars... Uh, let me start that sentence again. Uh, Mars is a long way from Earth. Uh, the Hubble telescope isn't because, of course, it is in orbit around the Earth. So it's mm. only, uh, I think its orbital height is about 700 kilometres. Um, but uh, the, um, the planet Mars is a lot further away. It must be in the region of 100 million kilometres at the moment, perhaps even further than that. So uh, to see something whose diameter is only 26 kilometres from that kind of distance speaks volumes for how effective the Hubble telescope is. And uh, what the Hubble's mission specialists have done is not just photograph Phobos once, they've done a sequence of images of Phobos because Phobos literally whizzes around its parent, its parent planet. Uh, you and I both know that the moon takes about 27 and a half days to go around the Earth 
How long do you think Phobos to takes takes to go around Mars, Andrew? Come on, a guess. Oh. Two Martian days. Uh, no, it's not. It's uh, much less than a Martian day. Six hours? Uh, uh, it's eight hours, that's Ooh. right. Pretty close there, eight hours. Mm. Uh, so um, the uh, interesting thing about Mars, of course, is that a Martian day is not that much longer than a day on Earth. It's no, one it's of the not. It's curious coincidences. It's 24 hours, 40 minutes. But Phobos whizzes round uh, at a height of about 6,000 kilometres above the surface, whizzes round in eight hours. It's a bit less, actually, I think it's seven hours 40 or something like that. And what that means is that uh, Phobos rises in the west and sets in the east. Uh, and not only that, but if you wait long enough during the same day, it'll come round again. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, very spectacular uh, stuff. And, um, I mean, the, the nub of this story is, is simply that, um, yes, the Hubble has uh, imaged Phobos. Uh, there's a be beautiful image of Mars, which I think is pretty easy to find on the web, made by Hubble. Um, the um, Phobos uh, images, there's a series of dots, which are successive images, I think 13 images of Phobos, which have then been strung together to make a little video, uh, which also shows Mars rotating. Very I'm, nice I'm stuff. looking at that animation right now, and, yeah. or photograph right now. Yeah. I'm just counting the flashes. It is 13. Ah, uh, there you are. Mm. And then you say you're not Asperger's. <laughs> I can well, actually, I, I, I can I actually don't count actually them. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I mean, when you compare Phobos to Mars, it's quite spectacular in that Hubble managed to capture this because, as you say, um, it's such a tiny little place. Yeah, and, and indeed, um, well, compared with the Earth's moon, which is a quarter of the diameter of the Earth, uh, you know, Phobos insignificantly smaller than Mars. And that's one reason why Mars's rotation has not been stable over Mars's history. So its axis of rotation has shifted by amounts of 10 to 20 degrees in relatively short periods, you know, measured in hundreds of thousands of years rather than billions of years. So it doesn't, Earth... doesn't have a um, tidally locked stable force to... A big moon to lock Keep it, it still, in. That's right. Yeah. So that's that's the thing with our moon. Uh, our moon, of course, is a large object. It weighs about eighty one, one eighty one of the mass of the Earth, and that's relatively large. It's big enough for it to have a, a, a stabilizing effect on the Earth's rotation. So uh, one reason why we have such a stable planet. Uh, in terms of its axis of rotation is because of the moon. And Mars doesn't have that, and so it's suffered the consequences. Mm, OK. Well, if, uh, as you said, if people want to take a look at this um, uh, photography by the Hubble Space Telescope, they could probably easily find it online. It's, uh, it's, certainly an, it's only a short series of photos, but uh, you can just see how small Phobos is in comparison to, to Mars and uh, a nice pickup by the Hubble Space Telescope team. You're listening to Space Nuts, Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, we're going to uh, focus our beady eyes and our inquiries and our uh, intelligence on, and we're talking about other people now, uh, the first known moon beyond our solar system, or exomoon. Now, I, you know, it wasn't so long ago we assumed there were other planets and other systems beyond our own solar system, and you know, 25 years later we know there are thousands upon thousands of them. Because uh, the next assumption is that some of these places had to have moons. So what is the first one that they've discovered? Uh, actually, I can give you its name. Um, it Robert. is called no. <laughs> Uh, it's called Kepler 1625b1. Mm. And the B refers to the planet around a star called Kepler 1625. And the one at the end refers to it being the first known moon of that planet. And in fact, it's the first known moon of any planet beyond the solar system, which is pretty impressive. It is. How was it discovered? Well, the name, the, the clue is in the name. It's a Kepler star, that means uh, that it has been gazed at by a, the, a spacecraft, the Kepler spacecraft, which has spent its career looking for dips in the brightness of stars that reveals uh, the presence of a planet. And that what happens is the planet passes between 
the star and ourselves and slightly dims the light of its parent star. Only by a tiny fraction, uh, as I've said many times before, if you were looking at our solar system from outside uh, and Jupiter passed between uh, yourselves and the sun, uh, Jupiter would dim the sun's light by 1%. So mm. that's a tiny amount. The Earth would be 0.001%, uh, much, much less. So it's um, it's a, a challenge to, to actually make these measurements. But by virtually by virtue of uh, the Kepler spacecraft, we've uh, increased the total number of exoplanets known by, by about 3,000. Uh, it stands at just over 3,000 now, and many of those, uh, certainly the recent ones, have come from Kepler. So uh, what happens when people discover a planet by this method is they look very closely at the shape of the dip, uh, the dip in the, in the light uh, of, uh, of the star, and then they, um, you know, they keep monitoring the star, and then if the dip happens again, then you work out how long that gap has been between the two in terms of time and speculate that that is the year of the planet in other words how long it takes to go once around its parent star and then you look for another dip that corresponds to it coming around again and so you can build up over time uh, secure observations that tell you you're you're not just looking at uh, you know, glitches in the equipment, you're actually seeing planets really passing in front of their parent star. So what they've done is look very closely at the shape of this, these dips and uh, looking for uh, any trace of a moon around one of the planets. And sure enough, with Kepler, whatever number I said it was, 16, 1625b, they have found a secondary dip in the light that suggests it's a moon. This is a pretty big moon, actually. Uh, the planet itself is about the size of Jupiter, wow. but actually weighs 10 times more than Jupiter, so it must be something pretty solid. Mm. Uh, whereas its moon is about the size of our planet Neptune and about the same mass as well. Good grief. That is uh, huge. It is. It's, it's enormous. Neptune's about four times the diameter of the Earth. Mm. Uh, be because it's... Uh, so big, uh, some pundits are referring to it as a Nept moon uh, <laughs> rather than a Neptune. Fair but enough. <laughs> team members have, have dubbed it a Nept a Nept moon. Nept moon. Um, yeah. The the um, the uh, observations are pretty well, um, you know, uh, uh, pretty pretty secure, but not absolutely a hundred percent. So uh, the Scientists who have been doing this work, uh, and they are based uh, actually um, at, uh, it, it, once again, in the United States, the scientists doing that work have uh, essentially put a sort of statistical level on it. Um, they say uh, the confidence level uh, that describes how unlikely it is that this is down to chance is the same uh, as tossing 15 heads in a row. So if you toss 15 heads in a row, that's the same level of, of uh, probability that this thing is an accident. So for my money, that's pretty good. Yes, yes. It and sounds it, like a fairly secure It opens up all sorts of other questions about what else could be out there. I mean, we've found probably most likely the first exomoon. Uh, that means there are probably most likely tens of thousands of them um, that, that are potentially discoverable around some of the thousands of planets we've already found. But it also opens up the question about a topic we were speaking about in our last podcast, which was comets. There has to be, maybe, um, other solar systems with the same comet activity that we have in our own. Absolutely. So, yes, I mean, we might expect eventually to be able to find exocomets, and uh, perhaps even exoasteroids. You know, if you've got a solar system that has the right dynamical conditions to create an asteroid belt like the one we have, then, uh, then yes, you've got potential to discover all these things. It has to be said, though, that these objects are very, very much smaller than planets uh, and, indeed, than Nept moons <laughs> like this one. Uh, so they're going to be a lot harder to find from mm. the distance that we are observing them from. I mean, remember, the nearest star is... 4.2 light years away, that is something like 40 trillion kilometers, uh, which is rather bigger than the distances we encounter in the solar system. So difficult stuff. Yes, uh, but as time goes on and technology improves 
these things might be easier to find. But at the moment, we're, you know, the fact that we've probably found a moon is quite an extraordinary leap forward in, uh, in our observational capability. So uh, that's, that's, a, that's a big win. And, uh, you know, um, we wouldn't have even thought about exomoons yeah. <laughs> 20 years ago, let alone planets. So That's it's, right. it's quite extraordinary. Amazing stuff. Yeah, who knows where the next one will be. Uh, this is Space Nuts, and you're with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Space Nuts. Let's take a break now and hear a word from our sponsor, the new podcast, Physical Attraction. Disturbed? Concerned? Maybe a little bit intrigued? Physical Attraction is a new podcast where your host will attempt to explain concepts in physics, one chat at line at a time. Find us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts, and on Twitter, at PhysicsPod. See you soon. Roger, you're live. We're here also. Space Nuts. Rightio, Fred. Now we're going to talk about a topic that people in the 60s knew about long before we even considered it astronomically interesting, and that is noctilucent clouds. It sounds like something out of Woodstock, but I'm, I'm sure there's something else to it. What are noctilucent clouds and where are they? Clouds of noctilucents, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could get it. Um, oh, never mind. At Woodstock. Um, the... Uh, <laughs> So noctilucent clouds, it's a technical term for uh, clouds at very high altitudes. So we're talking now about clouds at distances um, measured in tens of kilometres, distances above the Earth's surface, perhaps up as far as 90 kilometres. Mm. Um, and they, uh, that's what dif differentiates them from, from the normal clouds. Most of the clouds that we see are less than 10 kilometres above the Earth's surface. These are much, much higher. So um, the, the, the word itself gives you the, the insight. Uh, they shine at night. They're lucent or luminous uh, at, at night during the Nocti period. Uh, so uh, they, uh, they basically are visible when the sun is below the horizon. Um, they tend to be seen in the Arctic, uh, and Antarctica as well, mostly in the Arctic, though, because that's where people are during the during the winter when it's dark up there. And uh, what you have is a situation where the sun is perhaps 20, 18, maybe degrees below the horizon. And so there's no sunlight in the sky, but the sun is still able to illuminate these faint, wispy clouds very, very high in the atmosphere. And it, we now know where they come from, these clouds. They are actually clouds of frosted meteor smoke. So um, that height above the atmosphere, 90 kilometers, is where meteors burn up. These are you know, little bits of rock and sometimes things the size of a pea or even smaller hit the Earth's atmosphere. Something like 50 tons a day of this stuff comes into the Earth's atmosphere, burns up, uh, creates a smoke. And those smoke particles act as kind of seeding centers for water vapor to condense out on it. This is super cooled moisture that's risen from the ground uh, is, uh, is in the form of a vapor. But when it hits upon something solid like a particle of smoke, uh, you actually get ice forming around it. And so the noctilucent clouds basically are uh, clouds of frosted meteor smoke. It's a beautiful way to describe it. It uh, is. Courtesy of spaceweather.com. Uh, that's exactly what it is. It's, um, it's water vapor. And it happens during, um, predominantly, uh, actually, during uh, either the summer or the late summer, you tend to start seeing them uh, when the sky is starting to get dark at the end of summer. The ground is still warm enough for the, for the uh, water vapor to convect upwards. Um, and I, I guess once you get to the depths of winter, you don't see them. But uh, during the intermediate period between summer and winter, then they will be visible. Mm. Uh, why are they in the news? Because uh, Space Weather, which is a website I mentioned, has a stunning image, which has come from a spacecraft called AIM, um, a NASA spacecraft, which basically is uh, an Earth reconnaissance spacecraft. Uh, it, and they have pieced together... Uh, a mosaic of images of noctilucent clouds from space. And you can clearly see this beautiful, wispy uh, circle of light around the North Pole, uh, a silvery 
blue circle and that really reflects the colors that these things actually are yeah so worth chasing up that website and having a look it also answers a question that have that i've pondered occasionally and that is you know when a a meteor meteorite or something tiny just evaporates in our atmosphere there's got to be something left over they just can't be gone forever and there it is it's they turn to smoke yes they, they do it does that's right it turns to smoke just one um uh, sort of uh, footnote to this, Andrew, is that uh, we're seeing more noctilucent clouds now than we used to. And some pundits attribute that to there being a slight increase in global temperatures, which means you've got more evaporation of moisture from the surface. So there are, there's more uh, of the raw material to frost this meteor smoke, and namely water, water vapor, uh, at higher altitudes. So it may well be that um, noctilucent clouds will be seen more and more uh, commonly as time goes on and perhaps at lower latitudes, latitudes nearer the equator. I, I was actually going to jokingly say at one point, I bet these are caused by global warming. And, uh, well, <laughs> and, and unfortunately it is. Many a true word spoken in jest. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Fred, as always. Uh, very interesting. And we will catch you again next time. And a great pleasure. Thanks very much, Andrew. We'll, we'll talk again soon, I'm sure. Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory uh, joins us on Space Nuts uh, every week. Well, we try to do them weekly. Sometimes we just, we just can't get together, but uh, we're, we're doing our best. Don't forget to keep in touch with us via Facebook and Twitter, and uh, don't forget to listen to our um, sister podcast, brother podcast, because it is Stuart, not Stuartette. Uh, Stuart Gary with Space Time, available on your favourite podcast carrier. Until next time, thank you for joining us on Space Nuts. Space Nuts. You've been listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Subscribe to the full podcast on iTunes, Audio Boom, and Stitcher, or your favourite podcast distributor. This has been another quality podcast production from Sites.com. Today's episode of Space Nuts was brought to you by Physical Attraction, a new podcast that tries to explain physics, one chat up line at a time. Subscribe at all good podcast outlets.